see here. Okay, let me pull up the slides right here. Let's see. Oops. Anyone else coming anything or just, just a smaller group today? Everyone's on full of the attendee today. Okay, a little bit smaller today. That's okay. Can everyone see this okay? Yeah, I can see it. We are with us, everyone able to see it? Okay. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about um, blast injuries. Um, and there, this is kind of a, a pretty big topic. Um, there are a lot of, you know, blast injuries that can happen, right? So it could be from gas explosions, it could be from fireworks, um, it could be from, um, you know, it could be from like any kind of explosion that's going on. So that this is a pretty broad topic that we're going to talk about, um, but it's very important, right? Especially, you know, when, when there's any kind of, you know, incident that goes on, like a mass casualty, like a lot of people are hurt, we, we want to learn how to, you know, know how to treat, um, treat patients here. So the, every, did everyone look at the practice questions? Do we want to do the practice questions today or are we okay? Do we want to go through it or, or you, know, you just want to kind of skip ahead? Oh, I, I think we can work with the practice question a little bit. You want to walk? Okay, they were a little bit tricky. Right. Okay, so so this is the first one, right? So uh, an 18-year-old male comes to your ER after a firework explodes because he while he was standing too close. So he has full thickness burns throughout the anterior part, the front part of his chest and his abdomen, and the front and back of his right arm. So the question here is, what is the total body surface area of his burns, right? So, um, so there's a there's different ways to calculate burns, um, but this is important because, like we'll see later, um, we want to see how much of the body is burned, so we know how much fluid to give, and whether or not you know they need surgery or not. So the way we calculate this is the example right here, right? So each part of the body has different, um, it's a different percentage. So for example, so the front part of his belly, uh, the, if, if it's the front part of the chest and the abdomen, that's 18% of the body. Um, and then the, and then, so this is called the rule of nines, right? So each limb here, the arm is 9%, the head is 9%, the legs and the legs are bigger than the arms are 18%, and the front of the body is 18%, and the back of the body is 18%. So this is one of the, the tools that we use um, to figure out you know, how, much, um, how much of the body is burned. And so for him, we wanna look at it, right? So we wanna look at what, what the, the question says. So the question says he has full thickness burns for the front part of his chest and abdomen. And that means the front part here is 18%. And he also has burns on the front and back of his arms, which would be 9% right here. Oh, let me, I should start the recording too, right? Die, sorry, I forgot to start the recording. Let me start the recording. Recording in progress. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, so, there, so the front part of the body is 18% and the back and the arm is 9%. So we add these together and that gives us 27%. So because his right arm was burned and the front part of his body was burned, we can use this chart right here to kind of figure out, you know, how much of his body was burned um, and calculate the total body surface area that was burned. And that's how we get 27%, nine for the arm and 18 for the front of the body. So if it was two arms, it would be nine plus nine plus 18 for the front of the body, nine for one arm and nine for the other arm. So you can use this formula here if you, anytime you have a burn patient to kind of calculate what's going on. 
The other way you can do it is, so, so the palm of your hand here, Everyone's palm is about 1% of their body. So if you if they have a burned area of their body, you can use your palm to see how much area of the body is burned. And that way you know. So if it's one palm, it would be 1%. If it's two palms, it would be 2%. If it's three, it would be 3% of the body. And that's how we calculate the, the total body surface area that was burned. Any questions? We're gonna go. We're gonna go over this a little bit later as well as part of the lecture. So we're, we'll kind of come back to some of these topics a few times to get some practice in. Um, so this next question right here. So this is what we call. Um, so so we have here a thirty six year old firefighter is brought to your emergency room with burns all over his chest, abdomen, and back, and the front and back of both of his arms. The patient weighs ninety kilograms. So this formula right here is what we call Parkland's formula. So the way we use this is we want, this formula is used to determine how much fluid does someone need to get through the IV after they are burned. So the formula, so, so this, this is kind of, it's all memorization here, but the formula here is four milliliters of fluid multiplied by the percent of the body uh, surface area that was burned multiplied by the weight in kilograms. So we'll go back here, right? So remember, we talked about, so this person has his chest, abdomen, and back that are burned and the front and back of his arms. So he has pretty extensive burns. So if we go back here, so the front of the body is 18%. The back of the body is 18%. One arm is 9% and the other arm is 9%. So that's how we figure out the total amount of his body that was burned, right? So we have 18 for the front, 18 for the back, nine for the one arm, and nine for the other arm. And when we add that together, um, he has burns over 54% of his uh, total body surface. Remember, because we looked at the chart to see how much of his body was burned. So now that we know he has 54% of his body burned, we can use this formula, right? So we, we take four, see, uh, four milliliters of fluid, multiply it by 54, and multiply it by his weight, which is 90 kilograms. So when we multiply four times 54 times 90, that gives, this is the, this number here, 19,440 milliliters. That is the total amount of fluid that the patient needs to get in the first 24 hours. So, we, so he, they need to get all, of this. so this is the, the recommended fluid over the first 24 hours. And so, so after you get this number, you just need to divide it in half. So we give half in the first eight hours, kind of like a little a bolus and then half in the next 16 hours kind of as a as a like a more of a maintenance type drip so that so so you can so if you need to if you need an estimation this is a good tool to use to estimate how much fluid should someone who is burned receive um, and we'll, again we'll come back to this we'll come back to these questions as we go throughout the lecture here um, the next question here, so you have a 36-year-old female who's brought to your emergency room during a building fire downtown when a large piece of metal fell onto her right leg. The x-rays show a comminuted tibia and fibula fractures, and her legs are swollen with decreased sensations and pulses. She has some difficulty wiggling her toes. Um, so you obtain compartment pressures of her lower leg. So this is this question is, which pressures are most concerning? So there's a number of options here, right? So um, does anyone know what a normal, like what a normal direct pressure would be? There's two kinds. There's there's two ways to go about it. There's direct and there's delta. We'll go through each one. Does anyone know what a normal delta pressure would be? Maybe less than 40. Yeah, like it's definitely less than 40. Um, you usually want to go like less than 20 um, millimeters of mercury. So anything under 20 is probably not compartment pressure, uh, compartment syndrome, but anything above 20 would be, would be concerning for that. 
So here we said that, so A and B is the direct pressure is five and 10. So both of these are well under 20. They're well under 10. So these are not concerning for, for compartment center. So we can cross both of these out. So we'll go to the, so the next part is the delta pressure, right? So, the, so C and D are using the delta pressure there. And the delta pressure is a different way of measuring the compartment pressure. So instead of checking the pressure directly, the way we do the delta pressure is we measure the um, we measure the diastolic blood pressure and we subtract the compartment pressure. This is a different way of measuring the pressure. So the delta pressure is opposite of the, of the direct pressure. For the direct pressure, if we're less than ten, we think that's not compartment that's not compartment syndrome. However, for the delta pressure, if it's less than 30, we are worried about, about compartment syndrome because the diastolic blood pressure, say it's usually around 80 or so. And if you have anything less than 30, that means the compartment pressure will be up to be about you know, 50 or so. And that makes it that means it's a little bit more worrisome for compartment syndrome. So the current, like what we currently do is the delta pressure is thought to be a little bit more accurate than the direct pressure. That's kind of the recommended tool that we use right now. And again, we'll, we'll definitely go back, um, go back to this in a little bit more as we kind of keep moving forward. How this we, last question, yeah. How question? we calculate the direct pressure? How you can calculate it? You have a needle or something like that? Yeah, so the direct pressure, there's a, there's a, it's called a, a tonal gun. Uh, I don't know if you, if you have that in Vietnam, but there's a needle on the end and you, it, you just poke it directly into the leg and it tells you the pressure right there. So it'll tell you, so if you have, if you're concerned about the injury, um, you don't want to push it directly where the, the fracture is, but if you push it somewhere else on the leg, it can tell you the pressure um, that it is there. So it will, so there, there's a special tool called the tonal gun that will measure the pressure for you. Do you, do you use that in, in Vietnam? Not yet, John, not yet. Not yet. Ah, okay. But UMC not the, yet too. UMC not yet too. <laughs> not yet. Okay. That's actually yeah, yeah. a good that's a good point. Let me look into how else we can calculate the, the compartment pressure if you don't have the tonal pen. I'll look into that and I'll I'll share that next time with you. Okay. That's great, great. Um but let me do some research and see what else is available out there if you don't have the tonal pens there. Um this next one right here. Um, so you have a 24-year-old female scientist who comes to your emergency room with eye pain. Um, she says she was mixing chemicals when there was a small combustion. She wasn't wearing her safety glasses, and she feels a small pain over her right eye. Her visual acuity is, okay, it's 20 over 30, so that's pretty good, and she doesn't wear any contact lenses. Um, she, you, you use a fluorescent stain, like a little, like, uh, I don't know if you have that in Vietnam, like a, like a, a slit lamp. So you, you add the, the glowing um, dye into the eye and take a look. So what this, so the injury is right here, right? This is what we see right here. And the question is, what is this kind of concerning for? So this right here is what we call corneal abrasion. It's sometimes when a small piece of metal or wood or something gets into the eye, it can scratch the surface of the cornea. And when you stain it with this special glowing, um, special glowing liquid, it, you, you're able to see the cut right here. So that, that's a corneal abrasion. Herpes keratitis and herpes zoster ophthalmicus, it looks a little bit different. It looks like almost like a little tree or a leaf that's kind of branching on the eye. And that occurs when you have, um, uh, when you have zoster involvement of the eye. So A and C are for that. And conjunctivitis is basically redness over the white part of the eye. So those are two slightly different kind of um, uh, slightly different um, conditions there. Um, so here, there. Okay. And then so so all these questions, we'll, we'll kind of talk about them a little bit more as we go um, and get a few more practice questions in. So where do blasts come from? So blasts can come from a number of different things, including it can come from a gas leak, you know, from a car, from a boat. It can come from, you know, a pipe gas leak, you know, if, if the, the pipes under the streets explode there. Um, it can unfortunately come from a bomb sometimes. Um, it can come from, you know, fireworks or something like that as well. So those are all, like, blasts can be many, many different things. Um, it can come from a lot of different things there. 
So there's a lot of different, there, there's five types of blast injuries that will go for this. Is, this is not super, super interesting, but sometimes it comes up on the exams and things like that. So that's why we want to go over it a little bit. Um, so the, the primary, so primary effect of the um, blast is, this is basically when the blast wave passes through like a hollow organ. So kind of the, the, the common organs that we have would be like, you know, the eardrum, the lungs, and the bowel, right? Those are all organs with a lot of air surrounding it and a kind of very thin membrane with some air surrounding. So those are all uh, ways, um, th those are all things that the um, blast wave can break through. So it's very easy to break the eardrums, the lungs, and the bowel because they're, they're, they're very hollow and there's a lot of air inside of them. Um, the secondary effect of a blast is when you have what we call, you know, when like you have different piece, pieces of metal or garbage or rocks or wood that are flying around from the explosion. So this is usually penetrating trauma. You know, there are pieces of metal from the explosion that can injure someone um, and kind of like, you know, poke through them. Those are, um, those are the secondary effects of the blast. Um, the tertiary effects of the blast are when you have um, like the person, like, you know, sometimes the blast wave is so strong, it can throw a person against a wall or um, some a building might collapse or different objects might fall down and fall onto a person. So these are all blunt or crush injuries. And these are things that we can see with the tertiary effects of the blast. Um, and then the quaternary effects of the blast, um, this is like the, I, don't, I know these words are kind of hard, right? So primary is first level, right? Primary is the first level, secondary is the second level, tertiary is the third level, and then quaternary is the fourth level. So the fourth level, these are usually not injuries caused directly by the blast. So it's not really trauma, but it can be from burns, you know, if there's a fire going on. Um, it could be from radiation. Um, it could be from an inhalation injury, like smoke inhalation. Um, it could be from either asphyxia or allergic reactions to all the, 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 all the little dust that's floating inside the air or all the chemicals that are floating inside of the air. Um, or it could be something from like high blood pressure or anxiety or chest pain. These, again, these are not things caused by the blast, but there are, there, there are other things that can happen, you know, as a result of the blast that, um, that occurred. And the quinary, this is number, this is level five. This is basically, you know, poisoning or chemicals or kind of toxicology that's going on that happened because of the blast as well. Um, so let's go, let's talk about a case. So you have an 18 year old male um, sailor who was brought after a gas explosion that occurred on his ship off the coast. Um, he's breathing pretty quickly. He has a respiratory rate of 22 and he feels short of breath. He has some difficulty breathing. Um, your exam, so when you listen to his lungs, there's decreased breath sounds in both of his lung fields, and his blood pressure is a little bit low at 100 over 70. Um, anyone have any idea what you would be concerned about here? So very kind of, it's got a specific question. It's okay if you don't know, but anyone wants to take a guess? Pneumothorax. Yeah, like, yeah, very possible, very possible pneumothorax. Um, so what we have here, this is actually a, a special kind of injury. It's called blast lung. So blast lung could be a lot of different things, right? So essentially, this occurs when you have a large explosion, and then the the waves can can tear through the lung. So what you often see is this butterfly. The, the two little wings right here, this like butterfly type picture right here, this is pretty common for um, blast lung. You see the two, almost like the two wings right here. So, so this is blast lung, right? So it could be, like you said, it could be a lot of different things. This could be from, um, this is a very, it's the most common fatal condition from uh, blast injury. So the uh, when a blast occurs, most people, if people die, they will most likely die of this, of blast lung. Um, you, If you have someone who you think has blast lung, you want to give them oxygen. So either from a non-rebreather, the, the bag mask, um, either through high flow oxygen 
or mechanical ventilation. So you might have to intubate them or put a breathing tube down to help them breathe. You want to make sure they're getting oxygen. Um, you know, essentially what happens is the lung can tear or there's bleeding or swelling of the lung from the blast. Um, if the patient needs to be intubated and cannot breathe, you can go ahead and do so, but you want to hold off on intubation as much as possible um, because of all the, the fluid and the swelling around the lung. And kind of like Di, kind of like you said, if there's a pneumothorax, then you want to treat that and with, with a chest tube to help decompress a pneumothorax if you do see one on the exam. Um, so you want, again, so oxygen, um, and then if you see anything going on, like a pneumothorax, you do want to treat that as well. Uh, our next case, so this is similar to what we talked about, right? This is the case we just talked about um, a little bit earlier about the firefighter with burns over his body um, who is coming in. Um, and, we, and then we discussed the Parkman formula, right? Remember, we do four milliliters multiplied by the total body surface area, multiplied by the weight in kilograms. And that gives us the total amount of fluid that the patient needs in the first 24 hours. So the other things you want to get is you want to get basic labs, um, you know, to check his electrolytes and check his blood counts. We want to get a carboxyhemoglobin um, to check for things like carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, we can get a cyanide level to check for cyanide poisoning. Um, you want to check for things like um, coagulation studies. So sometimes patients can bleed very easily after a burn. Um, and you want to check urine for myoglobin, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, as well as um, a lactate, um, a lactic acid, um, which, you know, if the lactic is really high, it can be a sign of a bad burn that's going on. Um, you want to make sure you, you are able to control their pain because burns are very painful. So these patients, you want to give them strong pain medications to help with their pain. Um, and you want to um, and you want to talk to a burn center or a burn surgeon if you have that to talk about if you want to put any dressings, like kind of like any like coverings over the injury um, or um, or like if they need to be debrided, if you have to kind of scrape off the dead tissue there. So when you talk to the burn center and you explain to them what happened, um, they'll be able to kind of help you with that as well. Um, you want to consider intubation. So like a breathing tube down their throat, especially if there's burns kind of all over their face or all over their neck. Those are all good reasons you may have to put a breathing tube down if they can't breathe on their own. So here, the, the, there's different types of burns, right? So the superficial is when, when the first degree, um, it hurts, but there's no scar there. It's usually just on the surface area. Um, the partial thickness is when you, when you kind of go through a little bit deeper into the epidermis and parts of the dermis. Um, and when that happens, that, that's usually pretty painful. Um, and a full thickness burn or a third degree burn um, is when it goes all the way down through the dermis. And when that happens, there's usually not a lot of pain. You can't really feel it that much, um, but that goes all the way down. That's a full thickness burn. So those are the three types of burn. We have first degree, second degree, and third degree. Um, does anyone know what an escherotomy is? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, yeah. Do you want to share what you know about it? Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I can't. I can talk about it. Too. So basically, an escherotomy is here. Sometimes this is what we call circumferential burns, right? If we, especially around the chest area, if there is a burn around the entire body, the front, the side, the back, and around the side, like basically a loop around the entire body. When there's such a when there's a bad burn that way, it can make it very difficult to take a deep breath because the burn tissue is tight and it's scarred, and that can make it hard to get into to kind of expand your chest and take a deep breath and get anything in. And when that happens, that's very dangerous. And so an escherotomy means you would basically make a cut here along the side of the chest. You're cutting away the dead skin, but it loosens it up and allows the patient to take a deep breath. And that can help, you know, that happens when, there, when there's a burn usually around the entire body and it's keeping it very, very tight. 
Um, and so if you even if you intubate a patient, you still need to perform, you might need to perform an escherotomy to help with their breathing there. Let's see. We, again, we talked about this case a little bit earlier about the compartment syndrome. So again, with a 36-year-old female who comes in because a large piece of metal fell on her right leg. So remember, we talked about compartment syndrome here. So compartment syndrome, it's usually it usually happens because of a fracture, like a broken bone or a crush injury. Or something falls down and squishes someone's leg or their arm. When you push on their leg, you know, when you push on your arm right now, it's pretty soft. But if someone has compartment syndrome, it will be swollen, it will be firm, and it'll hurt a lot after you squeeze it. Um, this is the five P's or kind of like the, the ways that we use to, to think about if we have compartment syndrome or not. Um, so things like pain, um, paresthesia, kind of numbness or tingling or loss of sensation in the arms or legs. Um, pallor, um, which is like, you know, loss of color. Um, paralysis, not able to move a part of the arm or the leg. Or pulselessness, you know, if we check the pulses in the wrists or in the ankles and we don't feel anything, those are all concerning signs for compartment syndrome. And when that happens, we want to get an x-ray because the, the usually compartment syndrome can be caused by a fracture somewhere, a broken bone. So we want to get an x-ray to take a look to see if there's anything broken. Um, we also want to check the compartment pressure. It's kind of like we talked about with the, with the gun. And I'll try to figure out how else you can check the compartment pressure if you don't have that there. Um, and then you want to talk to orthopedics to the bone doctors for a fasciotomy if you think the pressure is very high. And a fasciotomy is just like when we talk about the escherotomy, right? Basically what happens is you have so much pressure building up here and the, the skin and the fascial layers are, are keeping the pressure in. That's why the pressure is high. So you want to make an incision along the where the compartment is so that the, you can let some of the pressure out and you can release some of the pressure. Um, let's, see, let's go on to the next one here. So the next one here, the next one here is, um, is rhabdomyolysis, right? Um, so rhabdomyolysis, this can occur, you know, also with crush injuries. So when someone has compartment syndrome, um, because something fell on their leg and crushed it, we also want to think about if they have rhabdomyolysis or not. Um, there are a lot of causes for rhabdomyolysis. It could be from trauma. It could be from injury. It could be from, you know, if you fall and you don't get up for several days, you can have that. Um, and sometimes there are other, med you know, there's different medicines that can sometimes cause rhabdomyolysis as well. Um, when that occurs, you want to get in, when you, if you think someone has rhabdomyolysis, you want to get an EKG to check for the electrolytes. So, you know, because they, they, they can very commonly have high potassium levels. And when that happens, you want an EKG to make, to see if the potassium is very high, you know, if, if the T waves are peaked. Um, you want to get a lot of lab studies. You want to get, you know, the basic labs. You want to check a magnesium and a phosphorus level. Um, you want to get a total creatinine kinase, which is usually going to be high in rhabdomyolysis. Um, you want to check a urine. Um, you want to check the coagulation studies or the, the DIC panel, the fibrinogen. Um, and you want to check a uric acid um, level because the uric acid can sometimes be more, uh, can be elevated before the creatinine kinase or the CK level goes up. Um, you can have something what we call myoglobinuria, which is a myoglobin, which is a, a muscle protein inside the urine. And what happens is if you get a urine sample from someone with myoglobinuria, um, their urine will show blood, but no red blood cells. And that is because the myoglobinuria sets off, uh, is very similar to the hemoglobin in the blood. So the, the tests think there's some blood in there but there won't be any red blood cells because the reason why the, the test shows blood is because of the myoglobin that's there, not of the hemoglobin. So it's like a false positive test, 
but it can show you that there's um, that there's something else going on, that there's some myoglobin in there. Um, some of the complications from, um, from rhabdomyolysis include high potassium levels, high phosphorus levels, um, high uric acid levels, um, low calcium levels, and because there's so many electrolytes and proteins, you know, kind of being excreted through the kidney, you can get acute renal failure. So your, your creatinine level may become elevated because of all the electrolytes and all the proteins going through the kidney there. Let's see. Any questions so far? No, John, you're good. Continue. Good. Am I still going too fast or is it okay? Should I slow down a little bit more? Uh, a little bit slower. Thank you. Slower. Even yeah. slower? Okay. Yeah. I, will slow <laughs> I, I will slow a little bit slower. Thank you. So um, our, our last case here. Um, so we have a gas leak explosion in the middle of the city causing a large fire. Um, the ambulance brings you a 56-year-old female who was rescued by the firefighters from her house. We don't know how long she was stuck inside her house for. So when she arrives into your emergency room, she says she has a headache um, and a little bit of blurry vision. She isn't having any difficulty breathing. Um, her breath sounds are a little bit decreased but otherwise pretty good all the way down to the basics. Um, she can walk on her own around the room. However, she looks a little bit unsteady. So what do you think this patient has? Any ideas? Cell poisoning, cell poisoning. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Exactly. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> yes, carbon monoxide poisoning. That, that's that's very that's right. Exactly right. Um, so you want to so whenever someone has smoke inhalation, you know, if they breathe in too much smoke, you know, they were stuck inside their home, there was smoke everywhere and they couldn't get out, then we need to think about carbon monoxide poisoning. That's exactly right. Um, and so um, you know, carbon monoxide. Bind, uh, binds to the hemoglobin inside our blood a lot more, a lot stronger than oxygen does. So, you know, if you're breathing oxygen, but you breathe in a lot of carbon monoxide, all the carbon monoxide will bind to your blood and there'll be no more room for the oxygen to bind. So you won't get enough oxygen circulating inside your body because the carbon monoxide has bound to it all. Um, so a regular pulse oximeter, the regular oxygen machines that we check, um, that will appear pretty normal. Um, um, that will appear pretty normal because it can't tell the difference between carbon monoxide and, um, and regular oxygen levels. So there's a couple of things we can do. We can get a blood gas, a venous blood gas to check the carbon monoxide level and also check the pH a level to see if it's, you know, an acid or a base in the blood. And there are special um, carbon monoxide um, machines that can check the carbon monoxide level. There are special machines that can do that um, to take a look at everything. Um, let me see what else. Um, if you do a CT head, it will show what we call hypodensity in the basal ganglia. And that's one of the, the later signs that we can see um, from, from carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and it, if you have a patient with carbon monoxide poisoning, you want to give them um, oxygen. You want to give them pure oxygen to kind of push away the carbon monoxide by a non-rebreather until the level is below 10%. Um, and if, if you check the carbon monoxide level and it's above 25%, then you would consider things like hyperbarics, which they don't have that everywhere. Um, but you, you, um, if you have a place that has the hyperbaric chamber, you can consider that as well. I don't know if you have that in Vietnam or not. Um, hyperbaric chamber, it's like a dive chamber. We have it, right? 
You have it there. Okay. So that's something you want to consider. You know, if your hyper if your uh if your carbon monoxide level is greater than 25%, you want to think about a um a hyperbaric because the 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 carbon monoxide is binding so much tightly to the hemoglobin and won't let oxygen in that you may have to uh, kind of put them in the hyperbaric chamber to help with that. Any other questions so far? That's all the slides that we have. We're a little bit early today, but we can talk about, you know, any other difficult thing. This is kind of a, a, a harder topic to talk about. So we can talk about any other difficult topics or things you want to go over or review or we can explain a little bit more. Any questions, or you can put it in the chat too. If you want to put the questions in the chat, I have the chat open too. So we can do either one. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you know that the uh, high, mm, the high flow laser cannula is uh, usually used in the last uh, pandemic. So can we use it in uh, CO uh, poison? CO poison. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, you can. They, they usually recommend the non-rebreather because you want them to rebreathe the oxygen that's like inside the bag. Um, but if you don't have a non-rebreather, yes, you can do high flow as well. Uh, what if we didn't have a CO oximeter? Yeah, that's very hard because not every hospital has that. Um, so if you if you if you don't have the CO level, you can try doing the VBG, the venous blood gas. Um, sometimes the venous blood gas will tell you the C, the the carbon monoxide level, but sometimes it doesn't. And if that's the case, you want to use your you know you want to think about the patient that you're seeing, and like why are they here, right? You know where they you know if the history tells you you know they had a lot of smoke, then you definitely want to consider the CO poisoning. So if you if you get the blood gas. And you don't, you know, your hospital doesn't have the CO level. You can look over here. You can look at the, you can look at the pH, right? Is it acid or is it base? Because if it, if there's a carbon monoxide poison, it will likely show as an acid. So you can use that to check as well. And then based on that, you can, and then you can, you can put the patient on oxygen either way, because the oxygen is not going to hurt them. It will just help them. So you can do that, and then you can keep observing the patient until you see that they, they are doing better, that the oxygen is helping push away the carbon monoxide. Let me see what else is here. What other questions can we answer? In the CL poisoning, I, uh -huh. I mean, heard that the, they have to use the hyperbaric oxygen. Yes. Hyperbaric so, oxygen therapy. But uh, it just uh, have in some, uh, in some center. It's, it's not really common. Is it right? Yeah. Yeah, it's not. It is not very common. So usually, if that happens, if you if you don't have the hyperbaric chamber, um, and there's nothing close enough to you, you can put them. You can do the high flow oxygen or the non rebreather. Continue giving them oxygen until you know they're able to kind of displace the 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 O2. You know, you may usually we don't intubate these pa these patients if we can avoid it, but you may need to do that too if the patient is not breathing at all on their own. But you're right, you're right. There's not, hyperbarics is uncommon and not a lot of hospitals have it. So you are absolutely right that you may have to try something else to, to kind of help with that if there's no hyperbarics. In the CO portioning, we you check the CT scan and uh, you have the problem in the, in the head. Um, did you have any treatment for this? Yeah, so are you talking about the hypodensity inside the basal gate, the CT head, you said? Yeah. Yeah, so the CT head, you can, those are usually, you know, side effects of the, the CO poisoning. If you give them oxygen, usually that will improve. But then um, if you um, do, yeah, if you do a CT scan of the head, 
um, in a patient that you think might have CO poisoning, um, it will usually show the hypodensity there. And if you give them more oxygen, sometimes that part can improve a little bit. Um, but this is one of the, the things that, can, that you see in the CO poisoning patients. What other questions do we want to talk about? Anyone else have more questions? Uh, in some cases, with smoke in hydrogen, do you use endoscopy for uh, the airway in 20, 24 hours? Endoscopy, endoscopy for uh, the airway? Yeah, for, for for smoke inhalation, you're saying? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. If you need to intubate a patient here, I would definitely use the, the glycoscope or the laryngoscopy, right? The, the camera to help you because especially for these types of patients, sometimes the burn around their face. Um, makes it very hard to, to see things. Right? If they're kind of burned around their face or burned around their neck, it can be very, they can be very difficult to intubate. So if you have the camera, you want to use that to kind of help you intubate as much as possible because those patients can be very hard to intubate. So yes, you do want to definitely use the camera to try to help you intubate that as much as possible. Uh, what about when uh, everyone had uh, airway burnt? And we burn. Oh, like, air, like if oh if you but, but yeah so if you um so when if you if you let's say you use the camera right and you look down if you um there's a lot of different cameras out there but some of the cameras that we use here the the bronchoscope like the camera that goes under the throat so if you use the camera and you look inside and you see a lot of burns inside the mouth or inside the airway you um you definitely want to you know observe those patients a little bit more because they may they may look okay but they could get worse very quickly and so if that's the case, if you see a lot of burns in their mouth or you use a camera and to look inside and you see a lot of burns there, you just want to make sure you're very careful that, that you know, if the patient is not doing well, you may need to intubate them early or you may have to observe the patient for longer um, to make sure everything's okay um, and make sure that they recover okay. Uh, if they have a uh, burn in uh, in the airway, uh, in your hospital, it use NAC, uh, it, NAC um, for inhale, nebulize, uh -huh. NAC nebulize for treatment the burn of the airway or inhale uh, inhalation injury. Oh, and oh, and uh, not NAC. Yeah, and said, yes, you yeah. can use it. You can use nebulized heparin um, and, and acetylcysteine, right? The NAC for the, the injury to the to the burns. That's right. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. What any other questions we want to talk about? Yeah, uh, Jonathan, uh, yeah. Uh, can, can you recommend uh, some detail when you receive the patient uh, with uh, uh, and X3 or uh, ammonia uh, poisoning. Uh, what, what kind of poisoning? Yeah. And X3 poisoning? X3 and then uh, ammonia, ammonia. Ammonia poisoning. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. Let me see what the recommendations are. Yeah. Oh, and X3 poisoning. So Usually when that happens, um, that can happen a lot, right? Because, you know, sometimes you use the, the cleaning materials, those all have um, ammonia on them. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, um, you can use something that sometimes you can use albuterol to kind of help with the treatment. Um, you know, especially if the ammonia is causing, you know, tightness in the lungs. If you give albuterol, kind of what we do for steroids, that can usually help a little bit. Um, we don't use steroids that much anymore, but the albuterol can sometimes help. Um, and you want to make sure, you know, you kind of look at their mouth and you look inside as much as you can 
to make sure there are no burns there from the ammonia, because the ammonia can cause burns as well. Um, and if you have a CT scan, you might even CT them to make sure the esophagus is okay, that the esophagus didn't tear, or that there isn't a hole there that requires surgery, because those can sometimes happen um, when you breathe in a, 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 a um, chemical like ammonia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Any other questions that we want to talk about? In my in year, we have uh, more than 20 patients with uh, burn inhalation. So in my ED, when the patient come, they will have uh, endoscopy like the, the house say, they unscuff uh -huh. the bronchite and they clean it up with the, the, the water or the, uh -huh. the natty sodium so that something like uh, the burn or the, something like the smoke can clean away uh -huh. and the patient will very breathe more easier than if you don't do have nothing because when you inhale a lot of smoke, they will be have some small substance so that they just, just like, you know, and uh, they, they, they cannot breathe easily. So we usually invite the endoscopy doctor and we do it emergency. That means they can clean it right away in the bed. Mm -hmm. And it takes only 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And after that, the patient can breathe easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, oh, my, oh, my, okay. We did it frequently in my ED. So uh, Dr. Sao asked about that, not about the intubation. She just asked that if you do the same to us, that if you have a small in inhalation and the patient mm -hmm. cannot breathe because of the uh, small the substances, it's just like something small and they block the alveolar mm -hmm. or block the tracheal. And they underscore and they clean it out. They just clean it out. And the patient will be easier to, you know, uh, breathing. Surely mm -hmm. they do it when they, you intubate it first. And they, they have a special one for endoscopy through the intubating tube. And after that, they clean it for 30 mm -hmm. minutes. And after that, the, the substances in the tracheal or alveolar can remove and the patient get better and SpO2 mm -hmm. is go higher and higher. That that we do in emergency chari. We do it. You do it pretty often there? Yeah, yeah, we, we do it often here. So if you have a you know, like the how it burning, we have a lot of patients mm -hmm. come and some of them yeah. have we have a small inhalation. And uh -huh. few of them will have endoscopy through the intubation too. And it's they, they do it in emergency. They don't move the patient everywhere. They do it in emergency very quickly. And they, they yeah. have a machine and they just push into the emergency room and they just uh -huh. clean it. It's very easy. Oh, that's good. That, 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 that's different than what we do. That's very interesting. Right. Right. We, we did it. And the patient yeah. get better and they, they, they survive. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, it's the same uses when patient come to the smoke, uh, CO is portioning. We invite the doctor, mm -hmm. a specialist, about some show is really safe to do bronchite endoscopy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's really cool. That's very, we, yeah, we have to, sometimes they'll do endoscopy here, but that, that's very, that's good that you have the specialist who can, who can come down and help. This is hot weather right now in Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. So they, they have a lot of burn day by day. So daily we have one or two burning home in Ho Chi Minh City. Oh, wow. So they, 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 the house is burning everywhere. So you had a big team every day, but not in Ho Chi Minh City, but also in Northern Province. Because the weather oh. right now is so hot, right now it's 40 degrees if you have in the middle of the you know, noon, and yeah. the, and we it's easy to to take a burn because 
we have a small house with the uh, substances like if you have a pen or something like easy to burn and after mm -hmm. the weather is so hot it's just burning right Up daily. So there's a lot of fire there's a lot of fires in the summer yeah a lot of fire in summer right now daily i think mm -hmm. that daily we have a one two house daily burning uh -huh. right. oh, wow. Wow. What other questions or things we want to share or talk about? So I have a question about yeah. the extra to me. Uh, in yeah. your in your say, uh, the the ED doctor uh, can uh, we be the most uh, extra to me, or we need to wait the surgeon? Um, so you usually I have I haven't done one before because I've never had a patient who's burned so bad to do it. Um, it kind of depends if you need to wait a surgeon or not. Kind of it depends on the, how the patient is breathing. You know, if they're having bad, you know, a lot of difficulty breathing, um, the, and the surgeon is not available, you may need to call them on the phone and they'll explain to you how to do it. Um, so it kind of depends on how bad the burn is and whether or not a surgeon is available. If they are available, then you can let them do it. But if they're not available, they may have to kind of talk to you about how to do it and explain to you how to do it. And that's why it's nice to kind of have a, ba you know, it's nice to have a basic understanding about how to do it so that when, when you call the surgeon and they tell you, oh, I need you to do it, I'm not in the hospital, then you at least know, you, have, you kind of know how to do it and the surgeon can help you on the phone. Your picture helps us a lot. This picture. Oh, I'm glad. I, I'll, I'll remember to send you all the slides again, too. I know oh. these are helpful, so I'll send you all the slides. Thank you. And you know, in Charay, burn unit doctor, we do it. The burn unit, oh, really? Oh, in the, yeah, yeah, the in burn, the burn unit. Yeah, the burn unit doctor is surgeon. So most of them okay, will be yeah. the, you know, uh, burn doctor and for yeah. uh, something like uh, beauty doctor, too. So uh, they did have a two kind, two job in one time. Uh -huh. So uh, they will do it for you or for me. For us, if they okay. have something like erectomy, emergency, easy. and they can do it in emergency too. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. And I saw before, very easy, but it's so scary, okay. so scary, but easy, but so scary. To, to, it is uh, scary, right? Yeah, oh, to, to, to cut it open, it is scary, but it helps the patient. That's why we do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is very scary. Right. Okay, so I think that's just, can we stop right now. Good. It's, it's good. Okay. It's good session, Great. John. I'm Thank glad you. to see you right now. So it's good to see you too. So we will meet you again next week, right? Yeah, we'll meet next week. And if you have any questions, with the WhatsApp group that we're all in, um, the one called uh, Vietnam Diploma, I think everyone should be in that one but you can always ask questions there and then i'll respond or you know shakira was one one of us will respond so the, the whatsapp group that we have the the vietnam diploma one ask any i'll try to post some th things in there too but ask any questions there and we're happy to talk about it during the week as well thank you john thank you thank you bye 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 thank you for coming <laughs>